All right, you guys. So picking up where we left off on, uh, let's see, Monday's um, posted lecture, um, I want to kind of pick up an idea that we be talked about pretty pretty extensively in today's Atlantic article, um, which is how the the Constitution and how the delegates at the Philadelphia Convention, the Constitutional Convention, how these dele delegates dealt with issues of equality, or maybe more accurately, how they didn't deal with issues of equality, right? Um, and so looking at this, we, we well, let's, let's go back a little bit. We talked about how do we count people, right? And, and, and for representation in Congress. And we talked about the New Jersey plan and the Virginia plan, which some was based on population, which is what Virginia wanted because it was a big state. And New Jersey said, no, we want equal. And so they figured out that issues of equality through the Cop Connecticut Compromise of splitting the Congress into two halves, the Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, but they, they, the next, I, I guess, topic was, is, is how to approach slavery. We saw in, in today's or, or uh, Tuesday's article that there were definitely some founding fathers who were early abolitionists and against slavery. Um, we saw how Ben Franklin owned slaves early in his life, but became an adamant opponent of it. And, and John Adams never did and spoke out, you know, vociferously on it. And Alexander Hamilton was um, a strong abolitionist. Um, but there were a lot of founding fathers that did own slaves, right? And it is a black eye on our history and something that we are, are obviously still wrestling with and, and need to process better. But how did the Constitution and the delegates um, at the Constitutional Convention approach slavery? And so I guess the first thing is, is to point out the hypocrisy that, that existed, right? Because we saw in the Declaration of Independence um, that all men were created equal, and you were creating this document that was rooting in, rooted in um, enlightenment ideas of, of equality and God-given rights and, and natural laws, according to Locke. And yet, basically, at the end of the day, we still created a constitution that allowed slavery, right? And, and a lot of the early founding fathers were opposed to it. Yet, as we saw in, in Tuesday's article, there was real fear that the, the union of the United States was too fragile and that if you were to prohibit slavery and really go to bat on your um, enlightenment ideas of equality, that you would lose the southern states and we would only be a United States of the north part of our country. And so the debate that we talked about today and you talked about in your groups was how should slaves be counted in population totals? Obviously, southern states, even as they were not wanting to consider slaves people in any other part of the, their society, um, they wanted their slaves to be counted as population numbers when you were talking about congressional representation, right? Like if South Carolina didn't count its slaves, then it was probably not that big, much bigger than Delaware. But if you counted its slaves, then it was a fairly populous state and was going to get a significant representation in Congress. And so, you know, if you're South Carolina or North Carolina or Georgia or Alabama or in any of these states, you want your slaves counted. But if you're New York and Pennsylvania where slavery was outlawed, do you want South Carolina slaves to be counted? No, right? That's going to give them more representation in Congress than you think that they deserve. And, and that shouldn't be. And so the compromise that they reached that we saw today was that in, instead of counting a slave as a, a full person, um, they elected to count them as three fifths of a person. So basically, you know, every, what is it? Let's do the math real quick. Every two slaves, and a little bit more, every two slaves would equal one, um, one count in the census when it came time to divvying up congressional representation. The next issue was of equality after they figured out the, the slavery question with the three-fifths compromise, or didn't figure it out, um, was how do you deal with voter equality? Right, you, they were coming from a British society where only um, landowners, wealthy landowners, were allowed to vote. Right, and so they're saying, "Well, we we believe it should be more than that." But at the end of the day, let's remember that the founding fathers of America were white, privileged men. Right, they were rich elites, 
And so there was this natural apprehension amongst the founding fathers, even those people that we glorify, like Jefferson and, and, and Washington and Adams, there was this natural apprehension amongst the founding fathers of too much democracy. We want to be a democracy. We we want to experiment with these ideas of Locke and, and Enlightenment ideas, but do we really trust the masses? Do we really trust um, the common people? And you know, I think Shay's Rebellion really drove home that the common people are scary and that they can rise up sometimes and they're, you know, they're they're uncivilized and that there was this fear of mob rule. And so, you know, the delegates came up with this idea that instead of setting a federal requirement for voting of who can vote and who cannot, we're just not going to deal with it at all because it's it's something that we just can't settle. We have too many differing opinions. Some founding fathers are saying you can't trust the unwashed masses and others are saying no, but we we have to because you know, Britain didn't and look what we got us. And so instead of actually ruling on it in the constitution, the founding fathers passed it on to the states. And that um basically the federal government uh, allowed that if a state said that a person could vote in a statewide election, then they were then automatically qualified to vote in a national election, which is a really interesting thing right now in Colorado because there was a recent law passed that 17-year-olds can can vote and so in state elections. And I, I don't know how that translates to national elections, but it is worth a look and I will report back. Okay, so the next issue, we know that the Articles of Confederation um, was one of the biggest failures of it was dealing with the economic issues of our new American society. And so we've settled some of these issues of equality. Um, we've settled all these, these issues of representation and argued and debated over the nature of Republican government. Now let's get to the money. How do, what do we put in the Constitution? That, that solves some of the bigger problems that the Articles of Confederation revealed. The problems were clear, right? There was a trade wars going on between states. We had you know, states like New Jersey and New York who were battling each other and taxing each other and putting tariffs on imports. Um, we basically – we saw that paper money in many states because it was being printed so – um, egregiously and constantly that paper money was essentially worthless and that, you know, your money from you know North Carolina couldn't buy you anything in Pennsylvania, which was really devastating to national trade. Um, we saw that Congress couldn't raise money to, to fuel an army or to, you know, create initiatives or build things or whatnot, that they basically had to ask the states um, to give them money. They were beggars. Of, of, of certain states and some states were flush and other states had none. And so the Congress, the federal government of these, this new United States couldn't raise money on its own. And so in the Constitution, and this is where the Federalists came in, that there was this belief that the only way you're going to fix the economic issues that are ruining our country and keeping us weak uh, was to build a strong national government. Right, we had to build a national government that had the power to rule on economic issues, to standardize currency, to prohibit trade wars, to tax and and spend and and build the type of country we want. And so they basically, in the Constitution, awarded a significant amount of power over the economy to Congress. Congress being a part of the federal national government. And if you were a state governor or a state legislature, like this was scary to you because, you know, you just took all the powers of the economy away from the states and you handed it over to the national government. And this is worrisome, right? Now with this constitution that's empowering the national government to do all these things, um, they can level t levy taxes. And they can, you know, pay debts and they can borrow money and they can issue money and all this stuff that that like makes you nervous because power is finite. And if you're giving up some power, right, somebody else is gaining it. And so, you know, the next question here is or the next thing that they're dealing with with economic issues is is 
like what I just said, right? That if they're giving these powers to the national government, that power is coming at the expense of the states. And so the states are losing economic powers. And so the last slide here, I believe it's the last slide, um, we're not gonna have a two-part lecture here today, is how do delegates deal with individual rights issues? And this will be the end of my, my lecture on chapter two. Um, I do have office hours um, this afternoon at, from 12.45 to 1.15 if you wanna come through and talk about your grade or talk about any questions you have on assignments, um, please make sure that you're there or just wanna, you know, talk about government. I'm also doing um, my college counseling um, and I'm, I'm exiting out for a second so I can pull up my calendar. Actually, here, why don't I just pause. 11.45 to 12.30 is an open office hour, open office hours for college counseling. So if you have any, you know, questions on your applications or, or financial aid or scholarship applications or volunteering or any sort of strategic advice, um, make sure you pop in. I'll answer your question. You can stick around here, other people's questions, or you can leave. Um, but let's take care of this last slide here today. How did the delegates deal with individual rights issues? And this was a huge one, a huge one, because as we look later in the week, we're going to see that this constitution that was argued over for many, many months was not going to be passed, right? They sent it out to the states, and the states by and large said, yeah, no, we're not going to sign that, right? We're not going to ratify that. Because of this failure right here, how did the Constitutional Convention delegates deal with individual rights issues? And essentially, the answer to that is they didn't. The delegates themselves thought that this would be easy, right? That they, all of these individual rights issues were implied in their created constitution. They believed that the states were largely doing a good job of protecting individual civil liberties. And so the Constitution didn't need to codify, right, or put in code um, individual rights issues. And so you, you basically don't see a lot about freedoms, personal freedoms and civil liberties in the main body of the Constitution. The main body of the Constitution lays out how Congress is going to be organized. The main body of the Constitution lays out, you know, how the presidency and the executive branch is going to be organized and sets limits on things and, you know, establishes checks and balances. But what it doesn't say a lot of in its, you know, 17 pages is about individual civil liberties and personal freedoms. The ones that it does cover, it covers the writ of habeas corpus. That basically, after watching King George violate this principle so egregiously of arresting people, throwing them in jail, and then when the person in jail would say, you know, why am I being arrested here? They'd say, well, you should know. You know what you did, right? That, that basically the Constitution did guarantee the freedom that the government must explain why you're being detained. You're being detained on suspicion of you know, possession of illegal narcotics. You're being detained under suspicion of murder. You're being detained you know, for driving a sto stolen vehicle. You can't keep secret why you are arresting somebody. That's in the Constitution. We also see in the Constitution the creation of something called an ex post facto law that basically says it guarantees you the, the protection from the government to the civil liberty of that, that you cannot be punished for something later that was legal when you did it, but became illegal after you did it. So let's say, for example, you bought a machine gun in 1968, and you had this machine gun all the way through the 80s, and then the, the Reagan administration passed a law that basically restricted access to automatic weapons, and you get caught with this machine gun. They can't throw you in jail and say, well, excuse me, sir, it's illegal to have this because when you purchased it, it was legal. And so that it is basically preventing you from being punished for something that, that becomes illegal later, right? And this, again, was something that King George frequently and the British government frequently did is they, they would say, well, we want to get these guys and what are they doing right now? Can we make that illegal? And then we'll just go arrest them for it. Um, they also guaranteed in the Constitution that there would be no um, restrictions on religious qualifications for office. That is forbidden. And then you also get a right to trial by jury, right? And, and this is pretty much it. And the entire main body of the Constitution 
right? This is the, the extent of personal freedoms that were guaranteed in the Constitution's length. And yeah, obviously we think about other parts of the Constitution and we come up with